<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Guided Listening, Episode 5 for Trombone Guide. Uh, I'm Alex, and I am so excited to introduce you to Dr. Chris Van Hoff. Uh, Chris is the professor of trombone at Ball State University. He is also um, a member of the ITA board and does a lot of work for the trombone community as a whole. Uh, Chris is an amazing player and an amazing educator. Um, one of those people that wears all the different hats of the trombone world and has all these different skills that he's cultivated to be able to be a versatile musician uh, in the 21st century. Chris did his undergraduate studies at Western Michigan University. Um, he did his master's at the Eastman School studying with Mark Kellogg. And he did his doctoral work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Mark Hetzler. And I'm so excited to ask him all about the experience of studying trombone at the university level, at the graduate level, how to navigate the different uh, entryways and gates of academia, and how to move forward with your trombone career as you begin to look at secondary educations. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Alex. This is a real treat. I uh, appreciate that warm um, welcome and introduction. And just do, uh, let me make just one correction. I'm not on the ITA board. I'm on the ITF staff. Ah, it's yeah. it's word salad in trombone land. So I work for the trombone festival. I'm not on the board of the ITA. Ah. Um, and then also, as my eight-year-old will tell you, I am a doctor, but I'm not a real doctor. He makes yes. that he makes that <laughs> distinction very clear. This is an important detail yeah. when you need medical assistance. Yeah, yeah. I can help. I can help heal you from trumpet, but I can't do anything else. <laughs> Which we all need on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, so I have so many questions from tons of viewers and subscribers to trombone guide everybody wanted to know tons of things about navigating the college process so we're going to try and dissect this and uh, treat this like a little bit of a back and forth where i will ask some questions that you've all passed along and maybe some of my own and uh chris will share his expertise and uh, i think we can all learn quite a bit here but i want to start by opening the floor up so chris can talk a little bit about what his trajectory entering college was like what his educational experience was like, some of the decisions he made, some of the, uh, the, maybe the good fortunes that he found, and maybe some things that he would have done differently going back so we can all learn from that experience. So Chris, if you don't mind just talking a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, I, first of all, I come from a very musical family. Um, I'm, I'm the youngest of three, and my older brother and sister were both in band and orchestra. Um, my mom was a music teacher and an organist and a great pianist. I was in choir with her from you know, preschool onward. So um, I really just kind of grew up all around music. Uh, the earliest thing memory I have in life is sitting on the organ bench with mom and I would turn pages with her. And at the end of a hymn, she'd point at the pedal and I'd get to stomp on the, the last note. <laughs> so I think that's where my love of low sounds came from. So um, I came from this very musical family. However, um, uh, mom like knew her, she knew her lane of like church music and choir and general music. So she didn't really know much at all about, um, you know, uh, uh, trombone obviously, but you know, things related to band and uh, jazz and things like that, which I became interested in um, thanks to my high school band director in uh, suburban Detroit. Um, but she got me a teacher in high school. Um, he was a, a band director near me. He was a euphonium player, but he was a, a good teacher for me. and. Um, he kind of helped me, you know, figure out some good schools to apply to. And I applied to, after going to a um, summer music camp at Western Michigan University called Seminar, um, that one shot right to the top of my list. Then there were a couple others in Michigan that I, and um, one in Ohio that I applied to. Um, and uh, I came down to two schools. It was for me, um, choosing a college to go to came down to, I wanted to be a music education major. And um, I really, um, had this idea that I was also going to be like a jazz all-star. So I wanted to um, be very active in jazz playing. Um, and so it came down to Western Michigan, which is a mid-sized uh, state school with a very, very good school of music attached to it. And Hope College in Holland, Michigan, which is a small private liberal arts school um, that did, it do, did and does still have a very good music program. But as you might expect, it's, it's pretty small. Um, so ultimately I made the choice because, um, uh, I, I wanted to be able to play in big band that was going to be really good. And I knew that the jazz orchestra at Western was very good. Um, I had built a really good connection with Steve Wolfenbarger at Western Michigan. 
um, and I was interested in studying with him. And um, at the time, there was also like a girl, and I thought I was gonna, we were gonna, we broke up, and I thought, you know, we were gonna get back together. And she, she was going to Western too. So that, I mean, that was part of it. I'll be honest. Um, uh, hint: We didn't get back together, but I did meet my wife in college. So that was good. Um, so good. I ended up uh, going, and the other, the other thing for me was cost. Um, uh, the the private school was just cost prohibitive for for me and for my family and um, I had a couple of small scholar music scholarships at Western but um, a good academic scholarship because I had good grades so that those were kind of the deciding factors and so I did it without really thinking a lot about how all of you now are thinking about college it's so great that you're thinking about you know how you're going to choose it was almost like a happy accident that I ended up at Western um, because there's no better place I could have gone uh, Steve is a legendary teacher yeah. and is is my number one mentor in the business. Um, I can call or text him any day and he'll help me out. And I frequently have. Um, so I studied there for five years. I, I was double majoring in music ed and jazz studies. And I realized that I was actually terrible at the trombone. And that made it really hard to improvise well. So the jazz studies <laughs> thing wasn't going so well. Um, so I dropped that. Um, I decided to practice trombone a lot. Um, I was not very good coming out of high school. And um, uh, I eventually added in um, a performance double major um, at the end of my sophomore year. So, um, but I was able to find some success early, um, really early on just simply by doing what Steve Wolfenbarger told me to do. I did what he said, I listened to him, I practiced hard. Um, by the my sophomore year, I was a one of the two finalists for the Larry Weehy competition for the ITA in Helsinki, Finland. Um, and I lost to 16 year old Achilles Larmacopoulos. <laughs> that guy knows how to play the trombone. Yeah. Yeah. I played first and then I heard him play through the door and I was like, but it said he's in high school. What's going on? Like, he's so good. So, anyway, um, yeah, Western was great. And a school like Western was awesome for me because I could play, I could explore all of the avenues of music that I loved. Pop pop music, symphony orchestra, jazz ensemble, brass quintet, trombone choir, it was all available to me. Um, and all at a high level too, like I said, very good music school at Western. Um, Wolfenbarger said that probably getting a master's would be great. His, his basic summary was, might as well get a master's and see where it takes you. Um, I loved teaching and music ed was never a backup degree for me. I was always going to be happy teaching public school. Um, but I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll do this in this period of my life and see what happens. So um, uh, I, actually, I got married um, right after graduation. My wife, Andrea, is also a very fine um, musician, a, a flute player, woodwind specialist. She teaches general music now. Um, and uh, I auditioned at a number of schools, and I got into Eastman, and I decided to go there. Um, and I studied with Mark Kellogg. I went specifically to study with Mark because he's as comfortable playing um, jazz as he is in, in symphony orchestra. Although funnily enough, I think he was the person I really learned what to sound like in the orchestra from. So he's an important role model for me. And then at Eastman, very importantly, I did the, I was a member of the arts leadership program in the Institute for Music Leadership. And that really shaped a lot of how I go about, um, have gone about my career. Um, I'll, sorry, I'll try to keep this short. So I studied at Eastman for two years. Um, through the ALP and a very long story that I won't share now, I actually ended up in March of the end of my master's um, starting full time as a public radio host for the classical radio station in Rochester. Um, and then I interviewed for and got the full time job that summer. At this, and it was the same week that I got my first teaching job, an adjunct teaching job at a school called Nazareth College in Rochester. So right out of my master's, I was very fortunate. I had a salary job in public radio. I was on air every day from two to seven. I was the afternoon drive time host. And I was uh, teaching at a really nice little liberal arts school, teaching low brass and um, a low brass methods class. And I had, I had a student of about 10 by the time I was done there. It was, it was great. Um, and then I was freelancing the whole time. So I did that for three years in Rochester. Um, Andrea and I kind of felt like we reached about as high as we could go in that market. And so we came back to, okay, let's try grad school. And if that doesn't work, back to Michigan. 
we'll, we have our teaching certifications, we'll teach, we'll be happy. Um, and it turned out that I uh, got a couple of really nice fellowship offers from some very good schools. And I ended up taking the offer from UW Madison, um, which uh, was a, I had what's called a university fellowship, which was actually based on my professional work. Um, not, it was not really, it, it didn't come from the school of music. So that university fellowship is awarded to people in all, um, all uh, majors for doctor, doctoral studies. And uh, so that work in radio and freelancing and all that really helps with that. Um, and then uh, while I was there at UW, my second year, I started teaching at University of Wisconsin Platteville, which is almost in Iowa. And then um, a very crazy month and a half, I was runner up for two jobs in one week that I really wanted. One was a, a military service band job. One was a college teaching job. And then a month later, I... Um, defended my dissertation proposal to my committee, left that meeting, got on a plane and flew to Fort Collins, Colorado and interviewed for the job at Colorado State and I got that job. So I fin actually finished my doctorate while I was um, teaching that year wow. at uh, CSU. That was only a one year position, so I had to reapply for that one and I ended up getting that job again. And then I was at CSU for four years total. And um, after four years there, I moved to my current job here at uh, Ball State University. And I just do, I always want to say this when it comes to that job change, that had z absolutely zero to do with the job. I loved that job at CSU. I had great colleagues, awesome students. Fort Collins is a beautiful place to live. It's just for family reasons. And also to be honest, the cost of living in Colorado, it just, it just wasn't working for me. Um, so I, I was, I kind of had to leave. Having said that, I feel really lucky to have landed at uh, Ball State, which is which is proving to be just as enjoyable a place to teach as uh, CSU was. And I'm in my fourth year here at CSU. So that was a little long. I tried to keep it short. Ooh, sorry. No, not at all. That's that's all really great. Um, I love hearing about all of the different trajectories and points at which you could have gone multiple routes. It's so interesting that, um, you, you know, uh, it seems like there are always different variations of right in terms of options that we have. And I think that your career is kind of a testament to that idea. And that's really interesting. Yeah. You know, I really got that in the arts leadership program at Eastman where one, one, one concept that came up was it's so important to allow yourself to define your own definition of success. I started at Eastman imagining that the only way that I was successful was if I won a job in an orchestra or in a premier band in DC and after countless failed auditions, <laughs> One that resulted in a cancerous sunburn from five hours on Interstate 90 and a speeding ticket right before I got home. It was a depressing day. I was like, you know, there has to be more. I have to be, allow myself to do more. And, and that's where this whole idea for me of, I always wanted to teach college from the time I was 19. That was really a goal of mine. But along with that, this idea of being the best freelance trombone player that I can be and the best teacher that I can be, that's something I grabbed onto. And that, that has, that's what has worked for me. And that has resulted in a much less stressful life trying to accomplish someone else's definition of success when, it, when what, I've, what I've really put my focus on doing is my definition of it, which is I'm happy and my family's happy. So. Yeah, uh, it's especially in a time like this with the pandemic going on and uh, you know, de definitions of success in performing exclusively in an orchestra are all very um, well, aqueous at best, I guess we could say. But, uh, <laughs> True. It's, it's interesting that uh, we have to look inside for that de definition of success being tied to happiness. And I, I really like that. I've always been a staunch proponent of the idea of um, not defining your life by how other people live it. So that's that's, that's yeah, what man. we talk about as well. Spot on. Um, and that wow. and by all means, that doesn't mean that playing in an orchestra is bad. No, no. Sorry. That would be. I would. I mean, I would love that. I would love that job. I'd be happy doing that too, but I've, I've it just wasn't in the cards. Living with the trombone. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Like music, exactly. You know? um, yep. So I have so many questions and I think we'll just, rather than go question by question, we'll go uh, age category here. And I think that it's probably sure. best that we start with uh, very accelerated middle school students or high school students that are starting to think about wanting to go to school for trombone, whether it's for performance or education or a minor, but they want the trombone to be an active part in their life, so they're gonna to have to do some college auditions. 
So here are, here are the real things that people are curious about. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And so would everybody. Um, taking a lesson. We all are told and we understand that it's a really great idea to take a lesson uh, with a college professor that you're interested in studying with. In fact, sometimes it's great to take two lessons a few months apart so you can explore how you would improve with that person. They can see your work ethic in a really visceral way. But there are just so many schools now. Um, so I guess the, the questions that I want to ask you are, one, how many schools do you think uh, a high school kid should be looking at applying to for, for undergraduate? What is, this, what is a good number? How would that breakdown look for you in terms of reaches, comfortable shots, and safeties? And um, how do you go about that whole lesson experience? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And I think that, um, well, first, um, I'll address just taking lessons with trombone teachers. I think regardless of what major you aspire to as a music major, whether it's um, performance or music ed or um, uh uh, here at Ball State, we have music media production. Mm -hmm. So like how to run a recording studio and do live sound. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with your trombone teacher. So making sure that this is somebody who, A, personally, you can like deal with for two up to four years, one hour a week, every single week, that's really important. And B, somebody who's playing you like, who's teaching ideas you like, who the way that they teach works for you. I think that's really important because um, in some in some respects, you might spend the most time of all with with your trombone teacher over the course of your college degree, regardless of your major. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to have a functioning, healthy relationship with that person. So the, taking a lesson with them is really important. I think it's really important. And the way I approach it when a student comes to me with that is that it's like I tell them, you are now auditioning me. This is not your audition. I'm not judging how you play right now. You're auditioning me and, and what my teaching style is like. And, you know, what you see is what you get right now. The way that, the way that we're interacting is what you're going to experience every week in lessons, also every week in drum and choir, also every week in studio class. So, like, you're stuck with this face for radio every week, multiple times. So... I think it's really important to do that. And lots of us now are set up to do this online. So that's an easy way to do it. Um, it you, can, you can reach out and connect with a lot of people. In fact, some of us have to do it that way. Um, I'm not really going to take guests on campus right now. So if you want a lesson with me, then it's going to be online. And I think most of us in the college teaching field are doing that. Okay, now trying to address um, how many schools, what schools, all of that stuff. Um, I think first and foremost, you want to decide what your major is going to be. Um, if you want to major in um, um, music education and there are no like full-time music education faculty at the school, then that's probably not a good fit for you. <laughs> if you want to major in music performance and they don't have, they, they have like a band and no jazz ensemble, no symphony orchestra, or, you know, so the performing opportunities are limited, probably not a good idea for you, you know? Um, so I think, you know, first and foremost, think about what major you really want to pursue. And then after that, I think it's important to um, identify, and Alex, I know you're going to, you're very wise about these things too, you'll agree. I think it's just important to identify, like, again, the trombone teacher, lots of time spent with that person the quality of the ensembles that you'll be in. Do they sound good? It's easy to watch them online. Almost everything is live streamed now. So check out some concerts from the schools where you want to go. If you're way into trombone choir or trombone performance, does the school do that? Is the trombone studio active going out and doing things? If that doesn't matter to you, then, you know, maybe that's less, maybe you don't really worry about that so much. Um, if you're, uh, you know, looking, sometimes this can be a, a good way to judge. It's not always, but like, you know, if you see consistently students from this trombone studio are like runners up or finalists or even winners of ITA competitions, that's a good sign if you want to engage in trombone performance. Um, so those are things to think about. It's also important to think about the location sometimes, although in college, I think it's fine to be insulated when you're an undergraduate. You know, I teach in Muncie, Indiana. It's not a big city, but that really is okay because your job is to practice. 
<laughs> your job is to learn how to operate your instrument well and be a great musician. Um, and very easily by car in normal times, you can drive to Chicago, Indianapolis, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and hear any of the Midwest's top orchestras. So you don't necessarily have to go to school in a big city to access all that a big city has to offer. Yeah, um, definitely. I'm going to jump in on that too. I, I, Chris, we both, we both did our undergrad at fairly insulated places. I was in Ithaca, New York. And, um, you know, there is something to be said for that experience. I, um, I, I was a, a performance and a music ed major as well. And I knew I wanted to be very passionate about education and also performance. And we had a community where we would get together and we would take trips down to Philly to watch Philadelphia play, or we'd go, um, you know, to, to New York to see the Phil. And they were trips that we would all, you know, go on together. We would bond as a studio. We would take multiple cars down. It, it's true. In undergrad, your job is to learn to play the trombone. And there are students that are ready for a conservatory environment for four years and then to be out as professionals playing, but it's not, it's a very small number of people. And it's not just how well they play. It's, it's a personality thing. You really need to develop the, uh, the maturity in undergraduate, uh, not just playing, but understanding music, understanding the trombone. And insulated places can be really beneficial for this. I, and in truth, I didn't know this. I fell into this by chance. Um, <laughs> So yeah, me I too. Just, I have to toss that in there <laughs> yeah. because it's, it's so yeah. important. Um, yeah, I agree completely. You know, uh, having gone to a conservatory for my master's, like there's there's no way I would have made. Well, first of all, I didn't play well enough to get into a, any conservatory, but there's no way I would have made it because I did not have the maturity, both both personally and musically, to to live in that environment. And like, I didn't play in youth orchestra in high school. I didn't practice very much. I hardly did anything outside of band class in school. So I, I was not ready for that. And that's why going to a school like Western was so, or Ithaca too, it's, it was so great because the performance opportunities at a school like that are many and of high quality. So you, you can get very, very good professional level experience at lots of schools that would be quote unquote smaller or in small towns or whatever. And you'll, you'll grow quite a lot from that. And then, if, if you so desire, you know, you can make the step to a, to a conservatory. So that's like one little last part of the question that you asked was, you know, how to decide what, how many schools to audition for. Mm -hmm. And I think once you've kind of answered some of these questions for you about what you're really looking for in your, in your undergraduate experience, then you can make that decision. Now, in my opinion, I don't think, I think once you go past like maybe five or six schools, you're probably doing yourself a disservice. First of all, it costs money to apply to all those places. Uh, now, most auditions are online. I don't know of many people who are doing them in person this year, but in the future, you know, traveling to all these places is expensive and it's stressful. You're also like a senior in high school and you have stuff going on. Like, you know, that's, I would limit myself. So, you know, maybe you, maybe you want to be close to home. Fantastic. Let's say you live in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the middle of my state. Okay, well then, if I were you, I'd audition at IU, Butler, and Ball State, and I'd call it a day. You have three very different schools. You have my medium-sized state school that's, that's a, you know, active trombone studio, strong music ed. You have Butler, which is in a big city. It's a private school. It's, it's smaller, but it's a quality music program. And you have IU, which is in a, in a college town. It's huge. It's an, it's, there's three trombone studios and 1,100 music majors. But it's you can hear performing, you know, playing of the highest level. So we have you have very, very three different, very, very different options. Or maybe you just know, like, man, I would never work in a real, in a really huge school. You know, that's fine. You know, then choose your schools based on that. So I think that that's important. You know, and maybe you know you want to, you don't want to be close to home. Okay, cool. Then choose some places out of state. Be aware that you're going to pay more money to go out of state, obviously. Some schools have out-of-state tuition reciprocity so that you can get a little bit of a percentage off if you're out-of-state and things like that. So it's food for thought. But, you know, once you're going past four or five, maybe six schools, you're really spreading yourself thin. And, yeah. I, can, I you know, can't agree anymore. Like, it's so I, I agree so much with that. Um, I see a lot, of, a lot of people have been messaging me with lists that look like seven, eight, nine, ten schools. And yeah. I, I just, I can't help but, and, and when I, when I engage with, with all of you listeners that, that send numbers like that, I always say the same thing. And that is, um, that's a lot of rep. That's a lot of auditions. 
don't you think you'd be better focused? And they say, well, you know, ah, these are all the best schools that I want to apply to. Maybe I'll go nine and one, and then I'll get in somewhere, and that just gives me a great chance. Um, and, and I can't help but think, uh, wouldn't you be better off with a smaller list that you can really focus yeah. on schools that you want to go to? At the end of the day, and I, Chris and I are kind of hitting on the same idea, your job is to practice. And you need to be in an environment that makes you conducive and inspired to practicing. And if you're the kind of person that wants to be the worst player in your studio and you just need to be surrounded by absolute monster players all the time so you're motivated to be pulled up, that's something important to know about you. If you're the kind mm -hmm. of person that wants to be really challenged in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a teacher, that's important to know too. If you're someone that likes to feel comfortable and have all this time and, and uh, a little bit of leisure in your personal life so that you can practice a lot and feel inspired, these are all conducive to different tracks and these are all different schools. Um, yeah. There are, and there I think are it's... heavy hitter schools, but like, you know, like uh, that's not, that's not the best place for everybody to practice and you might end up getting better going somewhere else. Right. And you know, the, I'm going to, I'm going to like name drop a couple of my colleagues in the field. Cause there are so many great trombone teachers in the world. I mean, there have been for a long time, but Man, as I survey the landscape in my work with the ITF, there's so much good playing and good teaching out there. Like schools you may not think about that are awesome, like um, studying at University of Akron with Elizabeth Schaefer. Or what if you went to University of Central Arkansas and studied with Justin Cook? Or Texas A&M Kingsville with Oscar Diaz and Megan Booten? Or what if you went to, you know, UNC, is it, oh, Jeremy, I'm sorry, UNC Greensboro, I think. Is, no, UNC Charlotte, Charlotte. is where um, my friend Jeremy Marks teaches. I mean, there are so many, and that's like, these are people who like are just, you know, who right off the top of my head who I know, but there's so many good teachers. It and the chances that there's that a... The same people came to my mind that you just listed. Those would have been yeah. the names I would have yeah. And that, that means so much. You know, I, I, have to, I have to agree so much with this because if you go to a school like Indiana University where there are, you know, almost 100 trombonists, that teacher only has so much time for you and they're obviously a great teacher and they're obviously going to prioritize you but wouldn't it be really special to have a great teacher's full attention because you are at a school where you can really be in a one-on-one -on -one setting with that teacher that really has the time it's it's a different it's a different situation yeah i do want to say because i've gotten i didn't know anything about iu till i moved here and i've gotten to know the situation there and for example at north texas where they also have you know many majors but three teachers and those faculty at schools like that, they they have their studios. Paul Pollard has his studio, and and um, he is he is absolutely him and Pete Ellison and um, Carl Linty, like they are there for their students. I do want to make that clear. I think the the size thing comes to just the size of the school and the number of ensembles and all that. If that and that works for some people, it doesn't for others. Right. And I've had students audition for me here, and they're choosing between Ball State and IU. If they choose IU. I'm like, that's awesome. You are going to do great there. Who are you going to study with? Pete? <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. I have a student who's auditioning for his master's at IU to study with Pete Ellison. So, like, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about it. I think what you and I both are saying, Alex, is that, like, you need to determine what, what you're comfortable with and what you're, what's, what you're into, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, anyway, yeah, that's, that's kind of oh, – go ahead. I was just going to say there's one other big – Thing to consider at, at this level and I, I just have to put a put a fine tip uh, point on it and that is uh, ensemble experience and the amount that you'll play in ensembles if you're someone coming out of high school that spent a lot of time in the practice room but maybe you haven't had the opportunity to do things like youth orchestra or chamber music maybe you've never played in a brass quintet maybe you've never played in a trombone choir um, different schools will have you playing different amounts based on the size if you are going to a larger school or a mid-sized school and there are a lot of great trombonists you may not get a lot of ensemble experience your freshman or sophomore year and uh, that may be right for you if you've had a lot of experience in high school playing in ensembles but if you haven't that's something to think about that's pretty important you know you want to you want to really make sure that you're getting the ensemble experience that is conducive to what you're trying to do so this kind of falls under that same umbrella of knowing your goals knowing where you're trying to go um, for sure yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. I think that answers all of all the yeah, points that were in that question. <laughs> yeah. Let's look at the same kind of question, but now you're, you're a grad, you're an undergraduate student looking to apply to grad school or maybe looking to make your next step. So there are a lot of questions under this umbrella. Um, 
trying to decide whether or not you want to enter the working world and take a take a couple years off school or whether you want to go straight into grad school um, determining what kind of schools are great fits for you determining when you have to make a financial decision you know if you're in a situation where a school offers you a full ride and it's a it's a great opportunity financially but maybe it's not your first choice school whereas this school would be a, a dream to study at but you have to take out some loans to do it how do you navigate that chris oh boy i mean so many of the answers to that are very personal you know it depends on what what your own situation is um so i guess the first thing is like if, if you know you want to get a master's in performance uh, for example um, do you do it right away or do you take some time? And I think that that depends on your level of tolerance for dealing with school. <laughs> like if you can, if you can take two more years of school and I, by that, I don't mean the trombone part of it. I mean like writing papers and stuff. Um, if you can deal with that for another two years, then in my opinion, strike while the iron's hot, you know, you're working with your teacher every week. You're like working, you probably just played, a, you're getting ready for a recital. You've got a bunch of repertoire ready. You're, you're playing at about your highest level, probably since you, since you started college. So that might be an opportunity to set you up for the most likely scenario for getting some scholarship help or an assistantship or something like that. It can be a little bit harder to do that when you go out um, and you're a civilian and like, you know, you work your day job and then you have to, you have to shed on top of that. It's harder to do. I've, I've been there. And when I started my doctorate, being out, out of school for three years and um, preparing that audition was I mean, I was playing a bunch, but you know, it was, it was, it was work to get ready for that. So again, that's a personal decision. Um, even more so than your undergraduate studies, I think the teacher for your master's is, is like, I don't know. I, that's the only reason I went to Eastman. There was a big part of me that felt like this was naive and I don't think this is true anymore but i was like oh well you know the name eastman is going to open doors for me well no you get what you deserve like you get what you earn in the world but um studying with mark was the reason i went there and that sorry mark this is like alex i know you know mark well this is yeah, speaking sure. about mark in a very well. transactional way but like that paid off <laughs> so thank you mark Kellogg. like the, what i learned from him both musically and professionally um has been huge for me you know and that's not to say that the other schools i was thinking about were bad teachers in fact the the other one that i i still feel bad about saying no was depaul with mark fisher um it was hard to tell mark fisher that i wasn't going to go to school there because i like him so much but he and i like we are acquaintances now and we've stayed in touch and he knows he knows me and i respect him so much and you know so that's that's for me, though, it was like, uh, Kellogg's got like the jazz thing. I, I think I want to do that. So anyway, um, that was that. And now, also, you're a little bit more of an adult when you go into your master's than your undergrad. So you do have to think maybe a little bit more about the cost of living. That's something to keep in mind. Um, that factored in for me. Rochester was cheap. That helped. Um, that's not to say that you can't make it work. You know, you can, you can absolutely like go to Juilliard or Manhattan but just be aware that the cost of living is going to be higher. So you're going to get, you know, less for your dollar or have to spend a lot more. And that's okay. Um, I think like Alex has alluded to, you know, it's really important. I think with your masters that you're also around great players. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a conservatory, but um, there are, because there are lots of great players as we've been saying all over. Um, but it's, you, you kind of don't, I don't think, want to be necessarily the best player in the studio when you start. I certainly wasn't at Eastman. Man, I'll never forget my first one or two first studio classes. And uh, maybe you know this guy, Pete Finelli. He's a Boston guy. He came in. He was a jazz major undergrad at Eastman. He comes in and he plays a Bach cello suite on his small board. And I was just like, I'm supposed to make a comment about that? Like, I don't know. And this other, this other person, Whitney Clare, she's a certifiable badass trombone player. She lives in Cleveland now, I think. She was a freshman. She comes in and plays the David studio class, and I was just speechless. I was, I, first of all, I thought five years ago I could never do that, and then I thought I can't do that now. Like, but then I was like, okay, this is good. I I need to get my butt kicked. I'm around people who are going to make me really work. So that that for me worked. But again, this is all very very personal, you know. Right. I got I got a little bit of financial offer from Eastman. I still had to take out loans, 
but I came out of my undergrad with not much debt at all. So I was willing to take that risk. Um, we'll talk about doctorate, I know, in a minute, but like for me, that was a non-starter. I was not going to pay for doctor school. Some of you may have a lot of debt coming out of your undergrad. I'm telling you right now, you don't want to add more debt. Go to a school where, where you've got a great teacher, there's a strong studio, and you, you can get an assistantship. Yeah. Or if you don't get it, I'm, like, I'm sorry to be harsh, but maybe that's the universe telling you that now's not the time to, to do it. Maybe you need to practice more get more experience or something because i've that's so that's so true it's so yeah true. i mean i i took my undergrad auditions right after my uh, final year at ithaca uh i had applied to five schools that were all very heavy hitters i thought i was a lot better than i was i went one for five and i didn't get enough scholarship to go and i called the teacher at the time that i was going to study with who ironically is the teacher i ended up doing my master's with and i i said toby i i, I really want to come to nec I, I, it's it's a hundred thousand dollars of loans for me to do it and he said take some years off practice go teach uh, public school just take as many lessons as you can reapply in a year or two pay your loans off from undergrad you're gonna have to do this time on the front end or the back end of your master's you might as well do it now and that decision of sacrificing a couple years gave me the ability to practice and practice practice take lessons with steve lang on the side and mark kellogg uh who was a hero of mine as well and i was just you know it was an unbelievable decision that was very difficult for me to accept at the time and looking back on it it was the absolute best decision and i can't imagine having mm -hmm. done it the other way so you're yeah. so right and i bet i bet you'd agree with this do you feel like you got more out of out of toby off to, after after getting your own more experience than you would have if you had gone right away and just paid absolutely yeah, absolutely. Because you were more ready to you were more ready to deal with what he had to say. When you come out of undergrad, you are hungry to get better, but you are not hungry to still be in school. If you think about it, you've been in school for nearly 20 years of your life without a break. Um, <laughs> you, you know, taking time off and, and working a job that isn't playing trombone where and I was teaching middle school band, but you could be doing anything. And that makes you miss practicing. I mean, this is an embarrassing story to tell on, on a Facebook Live or anything, but uh, I cried in the first trombone choir rehearsal back at graduate school. I mean, it was the highest level of music making I had made in years, and I had missed it so much. And it was just, it was the strangest thing. I just started crying, and I, I, I thought to myself, this is ridiculous, but this is, I know what, that this is where I want to be now. And I know I'm so stoked to be here, and I'm going to drive with 200% energy and i'm going to be at everything and i'm going to be there early and be taking notes and i got so much better just because of that decision yeah truly yeah totally yeah um it's funny you talk about eastman when you were there and like the quality uh, i would so when i was at ithaca i would drive up to take lessons with mark kellogg on saturday mornings and nick finzer had his lessons right before me so oh I yeah know, <laughs> i know all about hearing uh hearing mark know, play. he's I, I hope... on that that's our band's poster right there. Uh -huh. The funk band that Nick and I were in. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I hope that he and Mark both see this because that was that was something else. I, I remember just hearing them go back and forth and saying, My God, I want to play like this. Yeah, Nick's a bad dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then like so, Oh, then the you wanted to ask about the doctorate too, I would right? I'd love to get into yeah. the doctoral stuff just a little bit for sure. Yeah. So, you know, the doctorate was described to me as the dance card to get into college teaching. <laughs> like you have to do that. Now there are people out in there in the world who don't have doctorates who get tenure track teaching jobs. That's true. Um, when I was at Colorado state, we hired Caleb Hudson as our trumpet professor. He's in the Canadian brass. Yeah. I mean like his doctorate is the Canadian brass. Okay. That's, there are people out there for whom it's called commensurate experience where that happens for most of us mortals. That's not the case. So we, we kind of prove our worth in the academic Thunderdome by getting a doctorate and jumping through that particular hoop. So if you aspire to teach college, getting a doctorate is a very good idea. Um, unless, you know, you're really truly building a Canadian brass level of uh, performance experience. Um, so the for me again it was it was a non-starter i was not going to pay a cent and in fact um i i felt and this was not a selfish thing i felt like if i'm not good enough to get paid to do a doctorate then then i should like i said that's it i'm going to keep my freelancing but i just want to move back to michigan and be closer to family so i was fortunate again like i mentioned to get the offered a, a fellowship 
at a couple of schools and I ended up at Wisconsin. And um, so that worked out really well. I think the money is a big thing because if you're, I'm telling you, if you're investing, if you're thinking of investing a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars in a doctorate, that's not going to pay itself back. College teaching does not pay that well. I, I, over the course of my career, I will earn less teaching college if I if I just keep teaching trouble and then my wife teaching in public school. She will earn a, a larger salary. So you don't do this job for the money. You do it because you get some artistic liberty. You get to teach at a very high level with motivated high level students. Um, and uh, you get to have some a lot of autonomy over the kind of music that you get to play. So um, again, I, I don't think it's a good idea to go into big amounts of debt for a doctorate. Um, and once again, I think the teacher for that degree is super, super important. I also think the track record of the school for putting out people who are getting college jobs is important. Doesn't necessarily have to be in your instrument, um, but it should. They, that school should have a track record of placing people. Um, you know, when I when I chose Wisconsin, it was the school that I turned down. I think it was a little bit of a a head scratcher because UW like hadn't had a ton of placements. But um, when I was there, my colleagues in the brass area in who were doing doctorates, um, we all went out and like, or a number of us went out and got gigs. Um, my buddy, Matt Morellis, who teaches at a fi very fine school in um, San Antonio, Texas. My friend, Stephanie Fry, who's at East Tennessee State. Um, like there, there were some Alan Carr, uh, who teaches, uh, shoot, where does Alan teach now? Somewhere on the East Coast. Great bass drum one player, Alan is. We were all at UW at the same time. So that was really worthwhile. And like Hetzler was a great, was and is a great mentor for me, but I also found some other allies on the faculty to help me kind of navigate the academia thing. I will say this. I think an important thing to consider when you're thinking about a doctorate to, is to ask very clearly what the dissertation requirements are. Um, so I was, and Wolfenbarger told me this, he said, ask this question. So I'll give him credit for that because I was not really interested in doing a research degree, but for some reason, a lot of schools, even though the DMA is a performance degree, they treat it like a research degree because you got to write this dissertation with chapters and citations and all that stuff. And I didn't really want to do that. I would if I had to, but I would prefer not to. So that was a factor for me too, because at UW, you could choose to do a dissertation or what they call a doctoral project, which is what most of the DMAs chose to do. For example, Stephanie, who I just mentioned, who teaches at um, ETSU, Tuba, she recorded a solo album of solo Tuba, commissioned some works. That was, that was like her dissertation. I wrote six charts for trombone choir that were all in different styles for pedagogical reasons. And then I wrote a nice little 20 page paper along with it. That was my dissertation. So that was much more real world applicable. That got me much more ready for me and my colleagues who chose that option, got us much more ready for the job market, for engaging in the kind of scholarship that really matters for a performance faculty. Not, you're not gonna, like a performance faculty is not gonna get big bonus points for publishing papers. That's not our, our, our scholarship is performing. And recording and things like that so um anyway that that's there's not a it's it's not rocket surgery you know the doctorate masters similar similar things but i do think that the dissertation question is one to ask sure absolutely yeah. so i'm going to pivot here we're running tight on time but there's a yeah. really important question that i'd love to grab out of you and that is um if we were to hit each of those categories that we just talked about what are some of the things that set people apart i mean you look at a lot of applications for students and you've got a lot of experience doing this um, when you're looking at a high school kid that's applying for an undergraduate program, maybe in performance um, or at music education, what would be something on a resume that would make someone stick out? Well, um, if it's performance, I think one thing that's really important is I want to see that they've been taking lessons um, consistently with, with hopefully the same person. Um, and it's also, I think, on just, just on paper, it's a good sign if someone is playing in extracurricular ensembles. You know, if they're in a, in a regional youth orchestra or doing things of that nature, not just the high school programs. It's not say, it's not bad if you're not, but you know. And then across the board for undergraduates, I think um, I, I have learned in my college teaching that great playing 
and bad grades generally don't work in college. Um, good playing and solid grades, that works well. So I think it's really important for you to be a diligent student, to do your homework, to get good grades, and to also to make sure that you're practicing and you're generating a great sound and playing with good technique. There, those are like some simple things that I have just found, you know, are, are they, at this point in my career, I established them as rules. If people have a GPA in the twos, they generally don't make it. Even if they play great, they generally drop out because they can't handle the academic rigor of college. A lot of times you can't even get accepted to the university. So I think grades, you know, it's important you do your academic work you, and to practice. It's possible to do both. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're looking at um, two undergraduate applicants, and uh, they, they, they both come and audition for you. They look relatively similar on paper. What is something in someone's playing that will really make them stand out as an applicant um, once you've heard them? The first thing is the sound. I think all, almost all my colleagues would agree with that. The, the quality of sound, in particular for a performance major, is super key. It's really hard to, to it's not really hard, but it's, it's a greater challenge to develop great sound. That is the first thing that I pay attention to. Is this student generating really beautiful sound across the full range of the instrument? That's, I, I care about that more than anything else. After that, I'm, I'm really concerned about good time if the student is playing with good good rhythm and good time, that can be another challenging thing to fix. And then kind of, you know, going down the pecking order, basic um, good qualities of intonation, that kind of goes along with great sound. Clarity of articulation, I think, is really key. Mm -hmm. Cleanliness of slide technique is really key. Basically what I'm after, after the quality of sound, is does this student exhibit strong control of the fundamentals of trombone playing. Yeah. Accuracy, intonation, slide technique, clarity, articulation. I don't care if you play bluebells burning fast. If it sounds like garbage, then I, it's not, it doesn't matter. If you're playing it really fast, but it's like machine gun articulation, that's that's not right. It's not what Arthur Pryor sounded like, you know? So I had a student come in and play um, the Castorade once. Um, and it, it was completely the wrong style. It was loud. It was too fast. It was like very burly athletic. And the student was not interested in accepting any feedback about playing in the proper style. You know, it's so it's so true, you know, and I, I have to even say, and I know that I'm walking the line here, but um, with a lot of people posting a lot of their playing on social media, you know, I know there's an arms race of pressure on everybody to be putting out really high quality rep. And I am just such a strong proponent that you should not play rep that is beyond you under any circumstance. You know, there are totally. better uses of your practice time. Totally. I, I mean, honest to God, guys, like playing Rochus every day is a great idea. And mm -hmm. listen, I, Chris just told us, like, sound is king, tone is king. It's wonderful that you can play super high in high school, but it does not make that much of a difference. You can always teach range later. Sound is is everything. Clarity is everything. And, and I'm talking to 18 year old me because I did not understand these concepts. I had a terrible embouchure and a very weak high range. And I fixed those things because I had built a strong sound and I, and I strive for clarity early on. Those work ethic uh, habits make a huge difference. So yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I mean, um, some schools will require repertoire, but if you have a choice, man, play things that you sound good on. I would so much rather hear two Bordoni etudes that are gorgeous than you trying to play the David and you poop the bed with it, you know? Bad Bolero. Bla bad yeah. Bolero is, is such don't, a, yeah, just don't play the things that you sound good on. And that's the other thing to keep in mind, too. When you come in and play an audition, this is not like um, you walking through a minefield. We're not trying, we're not here to try to hear you play badly or to trip you up. All we want is to hear you present yourself in the, in the best possible way. We're your biggest fan at that moment yeah. when you play an audition for college. So, yeah, play the things that you're going to sound great on. Who cares if the kid at the school one town over is like playing the bourgeois for her college auditions? You go ahead and play more so symphonique and sound like Elaine Trudell on it. And then you're going to get more opportunities. <laughs> yeah. Someone comes in and plays more so symphonique sounding like Elaine Trudell. The first thing I'm going to say is, how do you make that sound? I would love to. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Can, is, uh, can I study from you? Is that Please, possible? Thank you. Share your secrets. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we are, uh, this has been so great. Chris, I, I know we're coming up on time here, so I'm just going to thank you so much for all of this. This has been so helpful. And uh, do you have anything that you're working on that you love to talk about? Maybe any projects going on right now that you can pitch? I'd love to give you a platform to just share sure. with everybody. Yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, my personally, my big thing that just happened was on November 1st, my brass quintet, which started at Eastman. We've been together for a long time. We released our debut album. It's on the Albany record label. Uh, the album's called Don Son. And it's all my arrangements, 58 minutes of music that I arranged for quintet. It's um, various pieces for piano and symphony orchestra. We have uh, the Don Son number no. two by Arturo Marquez, uh, music by Stravinsky and Ravel and Gabriel Fare. So a, a lot of variety on that. I'm really proud of that. You, you can find it on... website as well? Yeah, it's emeraldbrass.com. Yeah. And then we're also at emeraldbrass on all the things all check out emerald brass you should be following them they're putting out great material and um our chart my, my charts are for sale too you can buy those wonderful yeah um so that was a big one it's on all the streaming sites and of course you can buy a cd too if you want um and then uh, uh let's see right before thanksgiving here in the u.s i'm really excited to be giving um a master class for el sistema in venezuela this is the like the real El Sistema become friends with the lead trombone teacher in El Sistema named Trump, um, Pedro Carrero. I speak Spanish, um, so I'm going to be doing a master class for them. Very excited about that. And if you speak Spanish and you want to do it, um, follow El Sistema or the um, Escuela, de, Escuela de Trombone Ven is, is their uh, thing on Instagram or Pedro Carrero. And all those things are free and he'll post all the, there's lots of great stuff coming out of that. Um, and then uh, two buddies, well, three three buddies of mine who I mentioned earlier were, were our studios are collaborating on a project that should come out over the Christmas break. Um, Oscar Diaz and Megan Booten at Kingsville and um, Justin Cook at UCA uh, were going to put out a fun little festive video with our our trombone choirs playing together across the miles. So awesome. that's that's how we're I'm trying to keep busy. And besides yeah. that, um, Arbin's long tones <laughs> <laughs> can never do enough yeah. he really yeah. can't well thank you so much chris uh i can't wait for you all to uh to get some feedback on this i hope this is helpful especially in this time of applications auditions and uh recordings uh chris van hoff everybody thank you so much thank you and alex may may i add one last thing too Absolutely. if anybody has other questions i'm happy to answer you can find me on your internet your social media is easy to find. Please just reach out. I'm happy to answer questions and things like that. Awesome. So reach out. Thanks so much, Alex. This was fun. Absolutely.